So I think your texts are in your bulletin. Um, First Kings chapter eight is where we'll be starting. Okay, let's go in there. First Kings eight, verse twenty-three. But first, we're going to talk about your house, and you can you can envision or picture what your specific house looks like. And we're talking about whether we have a dirty house, whether we have a clean house, and what motivates us to clean our house. And some people say, nothing more beats me clean my house. I don't want to clean my house. I'll clean it as much as I need to, and then just live with it, because I really don't like cleaning houses. And some people really like a, a well put together house, and keep it all, everything, in its place, and a place for everything. What motivates you to clean your house? I think oftentimes what motivates people is when they know that someone is going to come over. If you know no one's going to be around or you don't think anyone's going to be around, you're, you're oftentimes less likely to do things. But as soon as you know company's coming, you got to make sure everything's in its place and everything's picked up and everything's clean because company's coming over, right? Maybe your mother-in-law's coming over and then you got to make particular care that everything is put in its place. It'll look good for other people, right? And if dinner gets coming, you don't want them walking through your dirty laundry sitting in front of your, your front door or wherever you have to keep it. This is what we call making your house presentable, right? Making it a place that you can present to someone when they come in and they see the space that you live in and it makes them feel it. Makes you a good host. So the question is, how presentable are we when no one is looking? When the door is closed, when the lights are off, how presentable are we? As the verse goes, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We always look at the things that we can see, the things that are presented to us by someone else, or the things that we present to other people. That's what we look at, that's what we look for, that's natural. But God looks past that and sees what's actually going on behind the presentation. Because appearances can be deceiving. We can deceive ourselves with them, we can deceive other people with them, but God cannot be deceived. So to shift the metaphor a bit, what motivates you to clean up your life? And how clean are we when no one's looking? Solomon in 1 Kings, he built a temple for God. Or this is right after the temple has been built. They're sort of consecrating the space and the Holy Spirit enters into the temple through this great cloud after they break the ark through the doors. And then he had this prayer after the fact. See, he's made this temple beautifully. If you read through the whole text of how the temple was built and all the particular details that were put into it, it was a, a massive undertaking. And he did it with particular care because it was such an important building. The presentation of the space was grand. But it doesn't make a lot of difference until the Ark of the Covenant goes through those doors and the Holy Spirit fills the space. Only at that moment does Solomon choose to speak about the temple, to pray about the temple. His prayer gives us insight into what it means for God to live in a temple. If you don't know where this is headed, we'll talk about us being the temple of the Holy Spirit. And what it means transitioning forward for what does that look like? was made for God to live in us. So we'll look at this and then we'll sort of bring it forward. Um, 1 Kings 8, we'll read the first number of verses here, starting in verse 23, where it says this, He said, that is Solomon, He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. 
the covenant that you kept for your servant, my father, David, as you declared to him, you promised with your mouth, and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep, your, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, There shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their ways, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your servant, my father David. The key verse here, verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. The temple is the best that Solomon has to offer. And he felt it wasn't good enough. The amount of planning, the amount of stuff he put into this building was so great, and he said, even then, this is not good enough for you, God. He says, my best efforts cannot possibly build a temple that is worthy of you to be in. Much less this house that I built. He says, the heavens can't even continue. How can I possibly fathom making something that you would be happy living in? And yet he has just witnessed the Holy Spirit enter into that space and reside there. Despite all of this, God chose to come down and live in his temple. Despite his imperfections, despite the fact that Saul himself felt like it just wasn't good enough, God said, I'm going to choose to come down and live here anyway. We may ask questions about our own hearts, about our own lives, about our own situations when we consider ourselves as the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we might, might say things like, this is what I have to present to you, God, and it just isn't good enough. I can never possibly be good enough for you to be, for me to be, or you to be worthy to enter into this space. How can the Holy Spirit live here on such a mess? So we can't possibly make ourselves presentable enough for Him. You can't clean up your life enough so that He'll want to come for a visit. It just doesn't work. Because He is not a visitor to be given a presentation. If we treat God as a visitor, that is the way that we will sort of do things. We'll think that we have to clean up our life in order to come to God. Or clean up our lives so that God can somehow enter into the space sometimes when we want him to. Because we're in church. We're the doorkeeper. We can let him in, we can kick him out, we can do whatever. But if we consider him someone living in our house, that's entirely different. He sees it when it's well and presentable. He sees us when we're on our really rough weeks and things are just going haywire and nothing is picked up after. And he sees it all. Because he's living. It's an entirely different way of thinking about it. Think about a relationship. The beginnings of a relationship, you start with the dating and the cologne and the showering, right? At least for guys, that's what you do. And you want to give a good impression to the girl. So you take her out to wherever and you do something for her and with her. And you make yourself as presentable as you possibly can. And oftentimes, after a while, as the relationship builds and as you get married and so forth, you find yourself sitting on the couch in your underwear and she comes walking through the room and it's just the way it is. Right? An entirely different frame of reference from when it started. Because when it started, you weren't comfortable doing that, right? There wasn't that sense of comfort, there was that sense of, I want you to see the best of me right now, so I can draw you in, right? Or you can accept me, or whatever it might be. And so I'm only going to present my best. And as we build that relationship, as we grow with that person, we realize, they see my best, now what are they going to do when they see my worst? How is this going to work? How is this going to play out? And so they see it all. Because now you are living with your spouse, right? You're engaged in this relationship together. 
that says for richer, for poorer, for sickness and healthy, the whole thing in this together. The two become one. And I think in the same way, our, our relationship with God can relate to this in a similar way. That God doesn't just visit, we don't just go out on dates with God. God lives with us. And He sees all. And we become something together that we never really were without Him. And when you become a, uh, back up from that, I was going to say when you become a Christian, when you, when you, Enter into a relationship uh, with a person, oftentimes at a marriage or afterwards or whatever, you change your name, change your last name. Usually it's the woman changing the last name to the man. Things are done a bit differently as the world goes around, but we'll take that as the norm for now, just for sake of, of the metaphor. Um, so the woman takes the name of the man. And it's not just something that happens. It's not just something that is required or optional or whatever it might be. It's a statement. Saying, I'm going to leave my old name behind, my old me behind, and join into an entirely different space with you. I'm going to now enter into your life, enter into what it means to be identified with you. In, uh, in chat, a lot of people, they don't usually use the last name because last names aren't as common there, they use the first name, so usually the wife of the missionary is known by Mrs. first name, right? So there's a, a couple of theirs, Jack and Nancy, right? And they would call her Mrs. Jack. It's just how they would talk about her. And some missionaries were being offended by this, that they're calling them Mrs. their husband's name. This is weird, but to them that was normal, right? Because it was their understanding that that's just the way it worked. That was them saying, you have the same last name. You are together. When I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to your husband. When I'm talking to your husband, I'm assuming he's also talking to you. And we know that's not always the way it works, but that's the ideal situation. And that's the idea of the relationship, is that it's not just two pieces, it's now one together. In Chad also, and in some other cultures, people are given a new name when they become a Christian. Uh, and they, in Chad they call this their Christian name. So they have their local name, which is in their local language, which you probably can't even pronounce or figure out what it is. And then they have their Christian name. And because not all of them are Christians, some of them say, it's my French name. But that's another story. So there's, there's this idea that they have a name they're given at birth by their mother, and then once they make a step to become something different or to make a change in their life, they're given a new name. And this is the new name they tell people, this is my name. And when people meet them who knew them when they were uh, young, they call them by their original name, they know that name, they're familiar with that name, but they say, yeah, but this is, I have this name now. They go, oh, okay. And they call them by their new name. And so there's this idea, whether it be a man joining with a woman, whether it be us joining with God in a relationship, that something has happened so significant that we leave an old name behind and claim a new name. And walk in a new relationship together. Where is this all going? Why am I talking so much about names when we're talking about a temple? But if you go on in verse 28, Look at what Solomon says here. He says, Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that your servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. God says his name will be in the temple. See, a name is a verbal representation of something. So for a wife to take a husband's name means I now represent him in some significant way. What I says is what he says, and what he says is what I say. It's a commitment to genuine honesty and communication. And to say that the temple is where God's name shall be is to say that the temple represents God. So if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the name of God is in us. 
I'm sure you've heard this before. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, so you should do such and such, because why would God want to live in a, a temple that's full of mess, right? The classic one I've heard is about drinking and about smoking. So you wouldn't want to smoke and you wouldn't want to drink because it, it reduces the, um, the realtor value of your house or whatever, of the temple, right? So no one wants to walk in and buy a house that someone's been smoking in or whatever. So obviously God wouldn't want to live in the temple that this has happened. And that's a normal way of looking at it because we look at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. So the temple is the place we can lay it all out and be honest with God. It's not always going to be presentable, but it's always going to be honest. And so when we say something, we can say, I've talked over with God, and he says such and such. In a same, similar way, we might say, I've talked over with my husband, or I've talked over with my wife, and we say such and such. I've talked with God because he's living with me. And I have this communication, we have this process, and, and so now this is what we're going to do. Now this is what we say. The name of God is in me. I represent God with everything I say and everything I do. To say that is to say that we have made a vow or committed to building our honesty and our communication with him. And start with the level of comfort we're talking about. Right. The idea that we can be there, and he can see us when we've got slow on, and he can see us when we're sitting in our underwear, and he knows it all, and we're comfortable in that space, and we know that maybe there's things we need to work out, there's things we need to work on, but at least we have a starting ground in place, right? Now, verse 30, it says, Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Here in heaven, your dwelling place, heed and forgive. So you have those three words, hear, heed, and forgive. See, people would come to the temple to meet with God and give their sacrificial offering to Him. They came with all their luck and said, this is me. I know this is my situation. I know I've messed up. Please forgive me and accept this offering. That's how they would enter into that space. They would seek to build a better relationship by not coming to God already presented and picked up and together, but by coming to Him in the entirely different way and saying, look, at least I'm trying. At least I want to engage in this relationship. While I am coming to the temple, I'm offering this to you, and I hope we can work this out. So we'll be honest, asking for forgiveness and offering ourselves to someone else. See, a relationship is not what you get, but it's what you give. I'm sure you've heard that in an a earthly relationship context. But to talk about it in a, a spiritual relationship context, we can say that a relationship with God is not what we get, the forgiveness from Him. That's not a relationship. That's just something that happens. But instead, it is what, what we give to Him. It's how we give ourselves fully to Him, no matter what might be going on right now. Instead of saying, I don't feel like I can really talk to God right now because this is happening or that is happening, or I feel like I'm just not the person. Well, that is the time you need to come to God. Say, this is where I'm at. Help me out. Help me deal with this well. Help me process through this well. I want to talk to you about this. I want to engage with you. God sees us, God hears us, God forgives. But he also wants to shape us into people who follow this same pattern in our own lives. To be a representation of him. So when someone who is far from God sees us, they don't just see the presentation of Christianity, but they see honesty and they say, there's something different. And they don't need to come to us and say, I want to know more about God that you're always talking about, but I want to know more, more about you because I can see you're an honest person. And I can see when I'm talking to you that there's just something fresh, 
So we need to be I want to know how that works. And we have an opportunity to speak with them. Solomon sees that as the reason why the temple was built. The temple was not built exclusively for the uh, Jews to be able to come to and get their sins forgiven and then move on. It was a space to join with God, but also to be a beacon of light to those around. Verse 41 talks about these people, the foreigners. It says, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a distant land because of your name, just that word again, your name, they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when a foreigner comes and prays toward this house. And then here in heaven, your dwelling place, do accordingly to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the people of the earth may know that your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked on this house that I have built. Someone far from God hears about his name because of the time. They learn to respect God because of this relationship. Do people hear about God through the way that we represent Him? Now, it doesn't have to look like tracks on the street corners or knocking on the doors. Those are specific ways that it can be done. But it could just be simple representation, right? When you see that person, you know that person represents God. I don't know what it is about them, I don't know whether it's the way they talk, the way they act, the way they walk, but there's something about that person that I know I can just go to that person. If I want to learn, if I want to grow, if I want to know what's more about them that makes them different. And so we preach through our life. And so if people respect us, we'll have a greater respect for God. If they respect God, but a greater respect for us. We'll show people what it looks like to be in a right relationship with God. It looks like honesty, it looks like genuineness, it looks like forgiveness. That we're the same when everyone is watching and when no one is looking. And maybe we're at a stage in our relationship with God where we feel comfortable around Him. And maybe we're at that, that underwear stage, I like to call it, we aren't afraid to not shower every week. But does that mean that scooping a shower is a good idea? It might happen. Things happen in life that make us less presentable than we would like. But does it mean that it's a good pattern to develop? Because while well, doesn't care, he's going to live here anyway regardless, so I can just not worry about that. Should that be the next step? See, I think there's a difference between being comfortable with someone and being complacent in your relationship. You can be comfortable, but as soon as that comfort becomes complacent, it's a different way of living entirely. It's no longer respecting the person, but it's saying, well, I'm just going to be here and they're going to be there. It's not going to really matter. See, I think there's a measure of realizing that we can be comfortable regardless of what we have going on, but also realizing that there are things that we need improvement on. There are ways we can keep ourselves in check in this relationship. See, sin is not an action that we need to stop doing in order to be more presentable to God. This is sort of a theme that we've been running off of as we've been talking about sin. But sin is simply an attitude of the heart that leads into this damaging way or lifestyle. Sin is the, the thing behind the thing that we're doing. So keeping our attitudes in check is extremely important. We could easily grow lazy, complacent, happy with how we are, saying, oh, I'm good enough. God's going to accept me no matter what I do, so I guess I can do anything I want. But we need to continually work on and improve, not for the sake of being acceptable to God, but simply for the sake of the improvement itself. And so we'll turn to Ephesians 6 in a moment just to sort of close off our time. Very famous 
passage of scripture that talks about the armor of God. This is one of those things that oftentimes we see as something that we wear to go into battle against the devil or whatever it might be, or to fight these temptations in an active way. But today I want to look at it in a different way and just see these are the things that help us stay in check when we're seeking to grow, when we're seeking to prosper, when we're seeking to flourish in this relationship with God. We're not simply seeking to not sin and to keep the devil away. We're seeking to keep ourselves protected. Keep ourselves in this space knowing that I'm in this relationship and I don't want to become complacent. And I don't want to become lazy. I want to be comfortable, but I still want to be active. And so verse uh, 13 of Ephesians 6 says, Take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day, and having done everything, stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. So first of all, we notice... We've done everything to stand firm. So we've actually done, not just done something, but we've done everything. See, sometimes we have this idea that God has forgiven my sins and so I don't have to do anything. Well, that might be true in a spiritual sense, but in a practical sense and in the way that we actually run our lives, there are things that we need to do. There are things that we need to uh, guideline we need to follow to sort of keep us on the, the, the same page, the, the even keel. Keep us going. The ways in which we continue to hone our relationship with Him. So we've done everything, and the first thing is that we put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So this is this idea that we're in this relationship with God, and we're so comfortable around Him that when He speaks truth to us, we're actually hearing what He says, right? Or to talk about what we said last week, we're not just hearing, we're also listening to what he says and we act it out. So when perhaps we haven't showered in two weeks and God comes to us and says you should probably shower, you know, at least once a week, probably every couple of days. You know, that's a good idea, I should think about that. And not just think about that, but then go take a shower, right? So he says something. And do it to improve our life. Now that was maybe a silly example or whatever, whatever you want to say about that. But that's something that, a way that God speaks truth into our life. and says, this is an area that I see that could use improvement. That doesn't mean I'm going to now move out. I'm here to stay. This is my temple. However, I think it could be there. I think you could be there. I think we can help each other and I can help you grow to be a better person than you would be living here. And we hear, and we listen, and we act. And I think that's what it means to have the, the belt and also the breastplate, knowing that that's the action from the truth that we've heard. We've heard this truth, and now we put on the righteousness, because that is the result of listening to to the truth that we've heard. Um, verse 15 says, As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel. Of peace. To me, this is talking about when Solomon talked about the temple being a place for the name of God to shine so the foreigners can see and they can come and they can worship. And God can hear them as well. That's what this is talking about. That we're always ready to proclaim this gospel of peace, that there's a certain uh, presentation about us that's not inauthentic, but authentic. So when someone else sees us, they see Christ. They go, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about them. I want to know more about God. And inadvertently we start talking about these things. And they hear about these things. And now a foreigner has heard about the name of God through us, through the temple. And now has the opportunity to come. Proclaiming the gospel of peace. And then verse 16, with all these things, take up the shield of faith with which you have been able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil. I think this is what maintains our comfort with God. There's a way to start being comfortable and then when we get to a difficult space, not be comfortable in that space. But faith is what maintains that comfort level. Knowing that I can present myself in every area, with every situation, to God, knowing that He will still stick around 
and also knowing that he will help you work through this. And we have faith in that, not afraid that something might happen or we might say something wrong or whatever. Um, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I think there's oftentimes when we think about salvation, we think about it as the single exchange that happens at a specific moment in our life. Are we saved or are we not saved? When did that happen? July 22nd, 2002, 2.02 p.m. Right? That's when I said that magic prayer. But I think as our relationship grows, we continually grow into this salvation. We continually give things to God that we had refused to or didn't think of giving to Him before. Things that were weighing us down, things that were causing us trouble, and He saves us from those things. He saves us from those patterns of life. He saves us from those, those areas that we didn't really want to be saved from or really weren't ready to be saved from. And we continually are refined through this process. I think that's what it means to work out your own salvation as well as being fully saved. It's sort of a, an interesting thing. How can you be fully saved and yet be working out your own salvation? How can God have saved you and yet also you're saving yourself? How does this work? I think we can be fully saved in the sense that we are saved in the spiritual level. That God has accepted us. We have received Him. But then we continue to work towards that and work into that through everything we say and do as we surrender ourselves more fully to Him every day. So the question I'd like to leave us with, or where we'd like to go with this, is what does your temple look like? What are we living in? What is God living in? And what motivates us to clean us? Is it simply to be more presentable to other people, to be more presentable to God? Because if that's the case, unfortunately I think God is simply a visitor there. And maybe he's a visitor more and more days of the week. But I encourage us to just think about that um, and see how we can be more fully living with God in every area of our life. 